Hey all, thank you Petra for this introduction and uh, let me start with our first round table. So before we start, I would introduce our panelists. So let me start with Mr. Edward Kranchevich from Company Petrol. So Mr. Edward started his career as an engineer in the field of industry automation. Later, he was working for the Institute Josef Stefan and today at Petrol, he leads the business area of energy solution in industry. I would also like to present two keynote uh, speakers who already spoke earlier, Dr. Noah Refords from Dubai Future Foundation and Dr. Vasilis Arguridas from Airbus uh, that you had chance to meet at their keynotes prior to this round table. So, dear audience, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to send them in the chat so our panelists may answer them at the end of the round table. And now, let's start. Our world is becoming more and more urban. We live more and more on the planet of cities. For example, 56% of our population lives in urban areas today. But that's nothing compared to what will come by 2050 when this percentage will increase to almost 70%. So as you can imagine, this trend presents a huge challenge for cities to better and wiser manage their infrastructure, space services, and for example, energy distribution. And that is why on today's roundtable, we will discuss new approaches to make cities more sustainable, accessible, livable for citizens and the globe. So, Mr. Ewald, could you please explain your approach in providing a holistic, integrative, multimodal, and almost all-in-one solution to help cities better manage resources? Uh, good morning and thank you for your question. Uh, so we are coming to back to the main question, how to manage cities. By that I mean uh, data resources, uh, resources, infrastructure, services if you like. So the question is what is our vision in this context? Um, all those systems are traditionally managed uh, with partial solution or in some cases even not managed at all. Um, and it, that, oh, this always was a challenge, uh, but we have developed uh, an answer to this challenge. So uh, an efficient, reliable data manager platform uh, with open architecture, and we are calling it Tango. Uh, so uh, solutions which are based on digitalization, by that I mean reliable and trusted information uh, in combination uh, with efficient use of energy, can help cities to manage their resources in a more efficient and uh, a more efficient way to improve their carbon foot, foot, footprint. Um, so uh, as a patrol, we are using this tool as a support tool for all of our projects. And uh, in this way, we are way, way more competitive. And we manage our projects in a more efficient way. Um, so uh, Tango Smart Management uh, enable stakeholders to answer the challenges of sustainable development and as well um, they can increase the satisfaction of, of their end users um, that is to create uh, better creative and self-learning living environment thank you thank you yes uh, so uh, petrol is the leading uh, energy um, retail and mobility provider in Southeast Europe. And we are going to another leading city, uh, which is a great example of rapid urbanization development over the last 30 years. So Dr. Noah, could you please elaborate more your approach for testing prototyping, especially pre-legal technologies before they become a reality? Sure, Daniel. It's a pleasure and thank you so much on behalf of uh, Dubai and all my colleagues here for having us in this exciting summit. Uh, I couldn't agree more with the further with the previous speaker and all of the keynotes were really insightful 
the reality is, uh, as the world population is getting denser and denser and more and more urban, the kinds of challenges that we face from a city government perspective are going to get more and more intense. Uh, and we're fully confident that we can develop solutions for this. But you know, one of my job titles is the futurist in chief uh, at the Dubai Future Foundation. And one of the jobs of the futurist is not just to uh, predict the car, but as they say, to also predict the traffic jam. So of course that's a metaphor, but uh, you know, we can only, as we begin to explore these integrated mobility systems, we can only predict so far into the future. You know, we might be able to, for example, anticipate some of the benefits and opportunities that aerial mobility might provide. But as these things begin to interact in a more complex way, you can never predict it. So therefore our strategy has been to focus on actual experimentation and prototyping. So to learn as rapidly as possible by doing it with our partners. And we really feel that actually through action is the only way that you can gain the knowledge necessary to effectively regulate and set up a kind of learning regulatory environment that will allow you not only to handle the challenges of today, but also the secondary challenges that uh, the solutions to the problems of today present and so on and so forth going forward. Mm -hmm. So that, that's really what's behind our approach to helping make Dubai a living lab to invite partners from around the world to test out these ideas that ultimately have people's lives at stake. It's about uh, safety, it's about security. And so therefore having a regulatory partner that can support this is, is essential in, in these sorts of pre-legal spaces, as we say, it's not technically illegal, it's just not legal yet. Oh, yeah, great. Thank you. So from leading city to leading aerospace company, Airbus. So Dr. Vasilis, you're working with European cities on defining the framework to make urban air mobility reality soon. Could you please share what are the key challenges for cities in Europe? Thank you, Daniel. Yes, Airbus has been proud uh, to lead the uh, UM initiative of the European Innovation Partnership on smart cities for the last three years. And in fact, uh, we have been in the lines that uh, Noah just uh, uh, outlined, uh, the need uh, to, to experiment. Uh, we need to, to use to have the cities to become the, the real living lab, as the title of your, of your summit, uh, because there is high uncertainty here, not, on, not that much on the actual technological front. We see more or less what it will be available. What is the rather unknown? It is how this will interact with the wider uh, urban mobility fabric. And in fact, um, as uh, we're discussing now, we are working all together to understand how we as a society collectively, we want to use this type of the technology. Uh, we want to avoid uh, a sort of technology intrusion. And we can admit, I think that uh, the case of the car, it could be considered such a case and why I say that is because everybody started to use cars uh, and now cities are taking cars out. We have seen the discussion from the city of Ljubljana, even at um, Dubai as part of the urban mobility policy, their considerations how to do cell mobility and so on. So I think here with the urban air mobility, we have the chance of applying uh, lessons learned and through intensive experimentation, um, to find the good uses of this technology for our society. So in a responsible way to, to introduce that. Yes. I also, I like a lot the approach uh, I have heard uh, about this pre-legal innovation, uh, because as I, I outlined, outlined uh, during my presentation, we need more agile policy frameworks and the regulatory authorities to be able to, emb to embrace and compass this type of technologies. That does not mean to use them, uh, but we need to have this mindset of uh, experimentation. Yes, so the concept of living labs, it's quite key for open innovation platform. And of course, urban air mobility will bring also new nodes or new opportunities for energy distribution network with all these new vertiport and telepaths. Okay. So I would uh, like to clarify one point here. When we say urban, uh, this is a rather umbrella term. Mm -hmm. Does not mean necessarily urban uh, or suburban or rural. We have to see it as a generic umbrella term that, in fact, what it implies is about low level flights over populated areas at scale. These yeah. are the keywords. And each of these keywords uh, provokes a number of uh, challenges and opportunities for us as a society. So mm -hmm. it's the safety, the security, of course, but 
don't tell me that any city would like to use any type of technology or system if it is not a priori uh, safe and secure. And if it is the case, then we have some other issues we have to address. It could be the type of noise, it could be visual pollution, it could be energy consumption. Mm -hmm. Then we we'll go to real issues that relate not to the technology itself or even the usability of it, but more about its integration and acceptance from the wider society. Yes. So, uh, but uh, of course, challenges under this umbrella are quite big. So I'm going back to Mr. Ewald, and I want to really learn from their experience because they are managing thousands and thousands of buildings in Southeast Europe. Uh, and what are the lessons learned? So, uh, Petrol being an uh, energy company with many years of experience on competitive regional market, uh, we are managing more than uh, 1,300 different kind of objects of facilities from schools, uh, public uh, uh, buildings, district heating networks, industrial size, uh, sites, and, um, public lighting, and, and so on and so on. Uh, so we, we are proud to position ourselves as a market leader in Southeast Europe. Um, and uh, our aim is to, to develop energy efficient and smart buildings. And so for the most of them, we are using Tango platform, as it was described previously, as a data management platform. Uh, for example, uh, through public-private public partnership, we have performed energy optimization on, on most of the uh, public buildings in our capital city of Ljubljana, uh, also mentioned previously by our board member. And uh, what is important here is that we, um, we are managing the entire cycle of project development from project identification, solution development, implementation, and at the end, facility management. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the most important part uh, because we can afford zero, zero mistakes. And that is why uh, tools such as Tango are significant for our business development. Yes, it's, it's really amazing uh, what yes, you do. Yes, indeed. Uh, what you accomplished. So just for our audience to understand, so those buildings are in, in cities around, uh, let's say, Southeast Europe. And exactly. if you put them together, it's quite a nice city, similar size to Dubai. So I'm going to Mr. Dr. Noah. You, earlier you mentioned that you are also a futurist, and this is really what I like. Uh, so could you explain us what are the future key infrastructure or emerging technologies that you will see that future cities will need? Uh, that's a great question. And I, I love the previous example because I think the, the future technologies that cities all around the world will need to manage this growth uh, are not necessarily technological in nature, as both my other panelists have mentioned. They are economic business model innovation, their political and social innovations. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, uh, in, in the previous example, which I just think is a perfect one, I'm not quite sure if, uh, if Petrol is both the owner of the energy, uh, energy production system and the operator of it through the whole value chain, but regardless, you offer an extraordinarily integrated package. And that's quite important because the ability to navigate the intersection between these different systems is going to be one of the key differentiators between success and failure or efficiency and inefficiency. And this requires a slightly different mindset to think about, uh, which um, many emerging economies are more, let us say, capable or familiar with. And that's the idea of uh, some degree of state involvement or endorsement in the market themselves, right? So in Dubai, we have a lot of state-owned enterprises like Emirates Airlines, and uh, depending on the different kind of activity, uh, their degree of ownership and operation and regulation varies. But what's essential to a fast-growing economy is the ability to stitch those things together. And that doesn't always happen necessarily in just a pure laissez-faire free marketplace, right? It takes a collaboration between all of the different stakeholders to be able to ensure that. So really the kinds of social and political technologies which encourage that kind of interaction across systems and across sales are going to be the infrastructure that's most important. It's not so much about the technological infrastructure, which as Vasilis has mentioned, is already years ahead of where we are in operational perspectives. So I, I couldn't agree more with the example from uh, the gentleman from Petrol. That is the key kind of innovation that successful cities in the future need. Yes. So, uh, Dr. Vasilis, so Airbus is also building a new demonstrators uh, for prototyping, testing, validating the new technologies. So could you share what are your latest urban air mobility projects? 
Well, as uh, I have outlined that you have seen at the video, we have completed uh, two vehicle uh, demonstrators uh, in order to better understand the design space impact of uh, uh, these technologies and the future architecture of the vehicles. But at the same time, we have completed a number of other studies ranging from uh, business to consumer business models, from public uh, policy considerations, from digital, physical infrastructure, mobility. So all of these create really uh, a strong repository of knowledge uh, for us in order to uh, go ahead uh, to develop uh, products that can be not only at the pioneering, say, states of sustainable aerospace, but will serve our citizens and the, the cities in a responsible way. Yes, and all this research work, it's basically connecting the dots to, for the end picture. So I'm going to Mr. Ewald, and before you were talking about your experience, but really I would like to talk a little bit more about the projects and why they're so special. Is there any project that you want to share with, your, uh, with our audience? Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, sure. Uh, in Slovenia, we say we are somewhere in the middle of the, of the heart of the Europe. And then we, we developed here a, a concept of a smart village uh, called Luce, already previously mentioned by, by our board, board member. So it was a pilot project under Horizon 2020 framework. Uh, but what is important here is that this is a unique combination of a self-supply and independent community based on 100% renewable energy sources. Um, and the interconnected resources behave like a unit. So uh, while in the background, the surplus energy is managed or stored, and the, need, uh, the needs are appropriately addressed based on the forecast and, and so on. So uh, in this way, we see an, an example of a future smart independent living district uh, perhaps stimulated by the fact that remote infrastructure is perhaps too expensive in some areas. So um, I have another example. So uh, especially here in our region, we have many large uh, industrial complexes that were built some 50 years ago or so. And uh, they are also closed energy distribution system. And uh, what we did, we, we actually conducted energy optimization, introduced several smart services and created a synergy between industrial and CD ecosystems. Uh, so we can, on one side, produce energy from renewables or waste heat, and then use it for mobility, heating, and so on. So such partnerships uh, with large uh, uh, industrial facilities and surrounding communities can play a big role in, let's say, some future public-private partnerships and are really possible answer uh, how to create sustainable uh, future. Yes, and you know, from Europe, where we have a lot of, you know, these 50, 60, even 100 years old industrial areas that we need to refurbish and rebuild and renew. We are going to, to Dr. Noah. So, do, the year 2071 will be a special year for UAE and Dubai also uh, has established uh, the area 2071. So not our audience to too much speculate what area 2071 means. I would kindly ask you to a little bit share with us uh, what is the role and the vision and the purpose. Sure, sure. No, it's a pleasure. Uh, as I'm sure many of your viewers know, the United Arab Emirates was founded in 1971 as a nation. And so we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the country next year. And because the foundation of the country's success has been one that is based on visionary long-term leadership and the courage to try these kinds of big, bold experiments out, uh, which is the, the time of things we're discussing now, uh, of course, on the anniversary of the 50th anniversary of the country, we thought, hmm, what's next? So 2071, 2071 will be the 100 year anniversary of the country. And we thought that coming up to the 50th year anniversary, there's a good time to start to reflect on what the next 50 years looks like. So at the Dubai Future Foundation, working with our partners in the Prime Minister's Office, the Ministry of Youth, many other colleagues, we created a space uh, in 
a building called Emirates Towers, which I hope you will come and visit someday, some of the viewers, uh, that is the center of innovation and government in Dubai, and one of the major centers in the UAE. And Area 2071 is a mix of, of kind of a, a co-working space, an accelerator space, we have several countries and residents with key partners, uh, and it's a space where you can come, try your ideas out. It is itself a regulatory exemption zone. We're able to write our own laws uh, to test these kinds of pre-legal technologies there and host the kinds of experiments that will be necessary for all of us to build the kind of world we want to see in the next 50 years. So 2071 is gonna be the 100 year anniversary of the UAE. Area 2071 is where the next 50 years are being designed and experimented with, and we hope you can all come and visit us soon. Yeah, I, I really recommend a couple of times over there, uh, and, and soon I'm coming back. But, and the last question, and then we need to conclude, and I know that uh, I would just wanna share with our audience, this will re this is recorded, and recording will be available for later. So, so uh, Dr. Vasilis, could you just a little bit share with us just how important it is to build those ecosystems? Because we hear a lot about partnership and ecosystems. And with this question, uh, we will also end this round table. Well, by definition, an ecosystem, uh, it is not just the different stakeholders, it's the relationships between them. And when you go to an emerging technology like, um, urban air mobility, you are talking about uh, an urban innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, so from this perspective, uh, urban innovation and urban air mobility ecosystem has all these challenges that any uh, urban innovation has, plus that now we go to the third dimension. This by its own, uh, it is a challenge. And you have seen the uh, noticeable uh, record of safety in aviation. This does not comes for free. Uh, everybody has been working hard from the industry to the regulators to, to the users. So the, the same sort of mindset needs to be uh, applied also to an urban environment where we have a lot of challenges because here in fact what we do, we reconsider what it means safety and security as we fly low and very close to people and over people. So that's why we need to have this orchestrated uh, approach between uh, the different stakeholders in order to address the interest and conflicts of each one. And when we manage to, to find a sort of balanced trade-off, then we can be more confident uh, as an ecosystem, as a society, that this is the way forward. So it is about trade-offs we have to make collectively. And that's, I think, the underpinning importance of why we need to have an ecosystem approach. Okay, thank you. The time is, is uh, we are basically uh, concluded. So I just want to thank you all for participating live. I wish you all the best and hope to see you back in 2021. Uh, and all the best. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Great job. Bye-bye.